Well, another opportunity to land a five-star goes by the wayside for the Ducks as Justin Williams commits to Georgia instead. So is Oregon just not going to get a five-star or a top 10 class? Don't count them out just yet. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show. We hit 2,800 on YouTube, by the way. You know what my goal is? 3,000 by the time the season starts. We're at the end of July. So we've got a little over a month to get there. So if you're watching this video, just hit subscribe below and let's get to that 3,000 number. Lots to get to. Justin Williams, what's next on the pursuit of Oregon's first five star and the future of the offensive tackle position? And a fun question, as always, to wrap up today's show. But the news of the day Justin Williams commits to Georgia instead of the Ducks. And this is kind of similar to Elijah rushing, kind of not. There was a point in time two weeks ago where Oregon felt like they were in the lead for Justin Williams, where they had some crystal balls for Justin Williams, who's a five-star linebacker. He instead, you know, kind of at the you know last hour, so to speak, is kind of how it feels. The other team comes in, Arizona for rushing. Now Williams here for, uh, for Justin Williams, and they snatch him away from our grasps. Now, I think there are, there are a couple of notable differences here. First of all, rushing was set to come in potentially or would have come in, I guess is the better way to phrase that, at a position of greater need, in my view, in the recruiting class, given that Oregon, right after he committed to Arizona, rushing that is, picked up Kamar Mathudi and, and Dylan Williams, both a pair of four-star linebackers. That is, does not mean... I was not bummed when I saw yesterday that Justin Williams decided to go to Georgia instead. But the second reason that this one is different, and look, I I, I talked plenty about the the rushing commitment, what that means for the Ducks and the recruiting potential and everything like that. But this one is not as much of a surprise necessarily. It is with the way the timeline played out and how things were trending and looking at one point in time, which is why you follow this stuff up until the very last moment because things can change in an instant. But Oregon lost this kid to Georgia. That's the two-time defending champions whose defense has been at the center of what they're doing. Now, Dan Lanning is very clearly trying to build that caliber of a defense up here in Eugene. That is what he wants to do. That's what I think we would all like him to do. And based on the way he's recruiting, based on the way he's talked about the team and the roster moves that he's made from the high school and portal ranks, that's what his priority appears to be. And Justin Williams, yeah, would have been a player who could have helped implement that sort of vision because he had a lot of upside. But he goes to Georgia, so Oregon moves on here. But I think it's different. That That's the biggest way it's different than, than the rushing element where... I think, you know, NIL and both the uh, both that and the playing time factor probably contributed along with the proximity because of rushing from Tucson to him going to Arizona. Whereas Georgia, it's not a hop, skip and a jump where you have to come up with all sorts of reasons like, oh, my gosh, why would a five star kid go over to Georgia? Why would a five star linebacker go play for Kirby Smart? That's not that hard to figure out. So I don't feel like this is an indictment of the coaching staff and their recruiting efforts at this point in time, because I fully expect them to be able to land at least one, if not multiple five stars in every recruiting cycle, right? That's what they did last cycle. They had a pair of top 50 players in Jerry on Dickey and Mateo Uyunglele. And I know Mateo lost the star after the fact, but that guy looks like a five star grades, like a five star plays like a five star And hopefully we're going to see him have a five-star type of career with the Ducks starting this fall. So when you come in in your first full recruiting cycle, you grab two. That kind of sets the standard of, okay, yeah, we're capable of getting those sorts of kids. And if you want to build a roster that is capable of competing with the Alabamas and Georgias of the world, I know the stars don't matter crowd are probably, you know, having an aneurysm listen to this conversation that I'm having with you all at the moment. 
I am not in the stars don't matter crowd. They absolutely do. They're not everything. They don't give you anything automatically. You have to earn it after the fact, but you're not going to compete with the best of the best in college football if you can't put together the same sorts of rosters that they have put together. If you can't get those big time high impact players, and yeah, Williams could have been that sort of guy. There are other players who could be that sort of guy for the Ducks that they're going to go after that I'm going to talk about later in the show. But I think it's disappointing in Oregon's recruiting momentum that they had, you know, at various points in time throughout the summer. I'd say it's definitely slowed right now, but that doesn't mean they can't get it back. Everything's got an ebb and a flow. It's just like a season. It's just like a season. You start out and maybe you have some really, really good games and then you have a bad one in the middle. But then you start to build and you build and you build and you build. And Oregon had a lot of hits early in the cycle. It was four-star after four-star, receiver, safety, corner, offensive lineman, quarterback, quarterback. It was, you know, it was just bing, bang, bong. Everywhere you looked, Oregon was getting a commitment. That sort of pace was never going to sustain itself. But then the caliber of recruits that you were going after, that you were still in pursuit of, we knew that these were going to be battles. And so Oregon's recruiting class has now fallen down to number 12 in the country, which let's, let's also just make one thing clear. Champagne problem in terms of recruiting for the Ducks, we would like to get to that next level. And it's why we are talking about that sort of champagne problem. But let's not pretend that recruiting is suddenly a disaster. Let's not act like recruiting is not going to be a top 10 class. Look, it might not be a top 10 class, but can they still get there? Yeah, absolutely. They can absolutely still manage another top 10 class. And historically, I think when you look at recruiting rankings and teams that win the national championship, you generally have to have compiled, I think it's like three straight top 10, 15 classes or so. And Oregon is well within that range. You'd always like to see them go higher. You would always like to land those five-star kids because sometimes they do end up looking like Kayvon Thibodeau and have those dominant sorts of careers. And that's what we hope Mateo is going to be or Jurion Dickey or a number of other players who have a lot of potential as highly rated four-stars. So I, I think that Oregon's recruiting is not great right now. I think that's the honest way to look at it is they've been going after these kids the types of players that you need to build the sort of defense that Dan Lanning wants, the types of players that you need in order to compete with the best rosters in the country to build that kind of dominant or at least, you know, well above average defensive unit to supplement what has been a continuously competent offense, no matter who's been uh, the head coach for the Ducks for, for the most part, given, you know, I, I know we can get into the details on uh, the, the Mario era and everything, but I, I think that that's, that, that's what we were looking at is like, okay, we'd like to go get these kids. Like we've built a really strong foundation for the class, but if you're going to put it over the top, if you're going to have a top five class, if you're going to stay in the top 10, you're going to have to land these five-star kids and they haven't thus far. Doesn't mean they won't. There's a difference. As my guy, Josh Pate always says, there's a difference between haven't and can't. They haven't yet landed a five-star in 2024. Does not mean they won't. Does not mean there are not other names out there, out there. Now, which I'm about to talk about. Will I be disappointed if we look back at 2024 and there isn't a single five-star in there? Yeah, a little bit. Depending on where the recruiting class actually ends up finishing. Now, I know the highest rated class in, in program history in 2021 actually didn't have a five-star recruit in it. They had some kids who were kind of bordering on, uh, on, on that threshold. You know, Kingsley... Uh, who, of course, transferred to BYU, was the highest rated recruit. He was really close. Troy Franklin was really cr close. Dante Thornton was uh, really close. There were a lot of names in there that were kind of in that, you know, 24-7 composite rating, like, you know, 97 point something or 98 point or, or whatever, right? Like bordering on a five-star recruit, but the sorts of players that you want headlining your recruiting class. And I think Oregon has a lot of really good, talented players, and they have great depth in, in this recruiting class right now. But do they have that guy? That, that guy that you look at and say that's a, a Mateo, a Kayvon Thibodeau, a, a Noah Sewell, you know, a guy who you look at and say, is that a year one impact player? Is that a future at first round NFL draft? But I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's harder to see that at this point in time. But the recruiting class is back down to number 12, which is kind of what you would expect because they haven't had any commitments in a couple weeks. And like I've been saying on the show, 
other schools are going to get commits. Other schools are going to land five stars. They're going to move up. Oregon is going to eventually move down if they don't, you know, keep pace and such. But they can still get back into the top 10, especially if they do end up picking, if they do end up landing a five star recruit. Several are still available to the Ducks that they are going to continue recruiting. We'll talk about them. We have to talk about eBay Motors, though, because when you're putting together a championship team and Oregon is trying to do that on the recruiting trail. You have to make sure that every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same. It's the exact same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. You got to have great pass rushers, good guys on the interior who can fit the scheme. Can they play inside? Can they drop into coverage if they're an edge player? Can you blitz if you're a corner? Can you cover a line or a tight end or running back as a safety? Everything's got to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. And when you shop on eBay Motors, you will have just that. With over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. It's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices. Guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBayMotors.com. eBay, let's ride. Let's ride with our second segment sip. Build off that momentum into second segment, of course. So, number 12 class in the country. We do still have, you know, positionally, a good, we're, we're still in a good enough place, I think, with Kamar Mathudi and Dylan Williams. Those were, you know, looking back on it now, knowing that we did not land Justin Williams. Yeah, those are even more important commitments for the Ducks uh, to have landed. But on, on the idea of, you know, landing a five star and who could those names be, there are still several names out there that, Ducks, that the Ducks could get, a couple on defense and a couple on offense. So the two that I'm watching most closely. Well, there are three that I'm watching most closely, but I'll talk about the other one kind of later. You'll see why in just a moment. The two that I'm watching most closely that I would really like to get, because if you're going to build that sort of defense that we're talking about, or the sort of defense that Georgia has, you know what you have to be is dominant up front. And you have to have the Jalen Carters of the world. You have to have the Jordan Davises of the world. I don't think Jordan Davis was actually a highly touted recruit when he got to Georgia, but he developed into that sort of player. But you need to have that sort of guy. And Dominican Sue, a Kayvon Thibodeau, a, you want to have the most, if you have a dominant defensive line, you can build a dominant defense. You cannot build a dominant defense without a great defensive line. If you can't get pressure with four, you have a very low chance of being a dominant defensive unit. You have to be able to do that and be disruptive, which is why the two names I'm looking at are Aiden Breland and Williams Duaneri. Now, depending on which recruiting service you look at, these are two of the top three, four, five, number one, number two, wherever. These are big time defensive line recruits. Now, I think Aiden Breland is the more likely one for the Ducks. We'll talk about him with uh, Brian Smith on, on Thursday's show, so make sure you tune in for that. And like and subscribe if you have not already, wherever you're listening to or watching the show, so that you can know when that show is in your feed. But we'll talk to Brian about where Oregon stands with him on Thursday. I lean towards him as the more likely option because though Dan Lanning has a tie to Kansas City, because that's just you know where he's from, He's from that, that kind of area out there in Missouri. That's where Williams Nguyenary is from. But Modern Day is a high school that Oregon has recruited well over the last couple of years. They have several Modern Day kids on their roster. They have one in the 2024 cycle. As a matter of fact, Jack Ressler, the three-star wideout uh, that the Ducks have, speedster kind of guy. So that's the more likely option given the geographical proximity, but I wouldn't rule out Nguyenary. But I would really, really love to get one of those guys. Because if you don't get one of those guys, you're relying on... And look, there are a lot of talented players who I, I'm going to talk about them a bit more on tomorrow's show as well, are, are going to be in the developmental aspect part, or developmental part of their careers this season, most likely, and perhaps ready to pop and make an impact this year. A lot of four-star defensive linemen in this 2023 cycle. There are 10. There are 10 defensive linemen in total. Some are three, but a lot of them are four-star guys. I think it's a 7-3 uh, split in there. But you got a lot of players 
who have plenty of potential on that front. But if you can land these sorts of guys, it'll help your recruiting efforts and your rankings, of course, but that all matters because of what will actually translate onto the field. And the prospect of having Mateo Uyunglele on, uh, you know, at the edge as kind of your premier pass rusher and having either Nguyenary or Aiden Breland as your dominant interior defensive lineman, that's what those great SEC defenses have looked like. That's what they've been stocked with. They have been chock full of players who have a bunch of stars next to their name. That's what it is almost every time. So I think that those two guys are where uh, Oregon's efforts should be. I think those are the two names that Oregon has been the most closely tied to on the five-star front. Now, if you're just talking about any position, there are a couple other names that are worthy to mention here. Uh, Nate Frazier is not... Uh, listed as a five star anymore, but he's you know got like the same composite rank ranking as Troy Franklin. Essentially, Oregon is a, a school that is after him. Carlos Lachlan is definitely trying to get him. I don't think that running back is as high of a priority. And if you told me would I rather have a five star running back or a five star defensive lineman, I would go with the defensive lineman personally, given where Oregon's running back room is at and looks to be in the future. But Nate Frazier's name uh, to watch potentially. I, I think Oregon's a little bit outside looking in. Again, Georgia coming in. Not like Oregon's losing uh, out on on most of these most of these recruits to you know chump change schools. Like <laughs> when you're losing out on recruits to Georgia, it's Georgia. It, there, there's just an, a, a level of inevitability with if Georgia really really wants a kid, they're probably going to be able to go out and get him. And it's tough to win those battles. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Because you'll never know what you're capable of if you don't, you know, give it a whirl and such. So, uh, Nate Frazier, the running back, Jordan Ross, the edge. I, I've I've heard mixed. I've gotten mixed signals from different people on Jordan Ross. He's a five-star edge prospect. Again, would love to have him there in 2024. If you told me the defensive line was Mateo, and then insert any number of the 2023 defensive linemen on the interior. You know, whether it's Terrence Green, Amari Washington, Mikhail Gardner, just like go down the list. If it's those guys and then Jordan Ross was on the other end, man, I'd feel really, really good about that. And I'd feel great about Oregon's defensive prospects. However, I have heard from kind of on the one hand that that is very much an outside shot and there isn't a lot of buzz. And on the other hand, I've heard don't rule out Oregon. And I think that's kind of the... I'm. I don't really know where to fall, honestly, because both people I've talked to about that I trust, and they have said multiple times, yeah, no, this is how I feel about the situation, and it's, there's no shot, or eh, I'm not saying there's a great shot, but just a name to follow. So we'll keep following the name, because I trust the guy who's told me, you should follow the name. So we'll keep following the name, uh, Jordan Ross. But the, the other five stars, speaking of modern-day high school, that Oregon is after is Brandon Baker. Now, Brandon Baker is the number one offensive tackle in the class of 2024. It would be beyond stellar, shall we say, if we were to somehow get Breland and Baker, who are both five stars and top three at their positions in the 2024 uh, cycle. I'm pretty sure Breland is. I know that Baker's been the number one guy for a while. Uh, yeah, 24-7's got him number two on the defensive line. The 24-7 sports composite has got him number five. You put it however you want. If Oregon pulled a, a pair of top five trench players at their positions nationally from the same high school in the same recruiting class, that would be kind of cool. I don't know if getting one means you could get the other, or you have a better chance at getting the other if you got one. But that's, again, something that I'll probably be asking Brian about on Thursday because those are the sorts of questions we'd like answers to. Now, Oregon is still in the mix for Baker. Last that I have heard is that Baker is still very much a possibility there. But that guy's a heavy hitter. Number one offensive tackle in the class. It's just not going to be easy. And I, I list all these names, you know, uh, I, I think likelihood that they choose Oregon, just kind of my sense and, you know, based on the information that I've gotten from people who are, you, you know, covering recruiting uh, more on the ground than I am, which is to say actually being on the ground for this sort of stuff. I'd say Baker's the most likely, then Breland, then Winery, then Frazier, then Ross. 
But those are still five names that that I'm looking at and saying, if you got any one, you know, any of them, if you're able to get two, I think you'd be doing great. Be nice to get at least one, and just kind of continue the trend of bringing in five star players to Eugene, making that a normal thing in the college football world. But as I've been saying, a lot of schools after him, a lot of other schools have money, a lot of other schools have good coaches. It's going to be a battle. But at some point in time, you'd like to see Oregon start to win these battles if they're going to recruit the way I think this staff has shown that they're capable of in in the class of, of 2024, at least as it pertains to, to the high school ranks. So that's where they stand on the pursuit of the five stars. All right. Couple mailbag questions to wrap up today's show. As always, YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore fifty five or at locked on ducks. DMs and mentions wide open. So this from James. Hey Spencer, greetings from Canada. Eh? Um, gosh, I'm the worst. What a terrible pun. Catching up on the last few days worth of episodes of Locked On Ducks and the recruiting news, and I have a mailbag question for you. Now this might be something to run by Brian or Max Torres, but with the quit commitment of Jaquan McCroy. The current roster we have in Josh Connerly and a Johnny Cornelius, and if we were to land Brandon Baker also, the Ducks are likely to have a real problem on the O-line in 2024. A good problem to have. Too much talent. Who starts at left tackle and right tackle? Depth is a great problem to have. Yes. But this one might be a head scratcher. Assuming that JPJ stays at center, it makes you wonder how the chess pieces in the offensive line are likely to be positioned. So, Baker, as I understand it, and the way that Brian Smith has talked about him is that is a day one kind of starter, and he is unlikely to go somewhere if he's not uh, a, a day one starter. Now, Cornelius is kind of the, the the wild card here of sorts. I don't know if we know exactly what to expect from him. He's coming from the FCS level. He grades as a four-star transfer on 24-7. I, I think his upside, I thought he did well in the spring game. His upside is very real. He was a highly coveted offensive lineman uh, in, in the transfer portal this offseason for a reason. But I think you could have a number of different factors here that could play into this kind of settling of uh, in, in, in a sense. So first of all, if Cornelius is really, really good, like if he has a great year, the kind of year I would love for him to have, Remember, he played two years at Rhode Island. He could be off to the NFL. That's number one. Number two, Jaquan McCroy is a unique physical prospect. He's something like 6'80". Six, six uh, I want to uh, double check that. 6'80". Six, six uh, 6'8", 365 pounds is what he is listed at. He's a big, big dude. I don't think that McCroy has the expectation to come in and start day one the day that Brand the way that Brandon Baker does. Now, Josh Connerly was also a highly rated five star recruit, and if memory serves, double checking this stuff on uh, on the fly here a little bit. But if you can't multitask, can you really do podcasting? Probably not. Connerly was indeed, as I double checked myself the number one offensive tackle in the class of 2022. So he would be entering his third season, but Connerly did not start as a true freshman. So it would come down to, I, I th this may be a good question for Brian on Thursday. Is Baker different than Connerly in that he won't go somewhere where he's only going to be a partial player, right? Like Connerly played in, I believe every game Oregon had in 2022 and looks to be our starting left tackle in 2023. Would Baker be willing to do that? Don't know. Again, probably a good question for Brian. In fact, I'm going to jot that down uh, right now. Just, just so, just so I don't forget. Okay. So we'll get an answer from him there, but between those those factors of not starting every single game as a true freshman, even as the number one offensive tackle, the idea that Cornelius 
could go to uh, the NFL. Or, and I'm not rooting for this, just saying that it is a reality of football, injuries are also a thing. And I don't expect any of those guys are going to, you know, change positions in order to see the field. But offensive line uh, linemen get dinged up all the time. We, we, we had... I think seven, seven or eight offensive linemen play real meaningful snaps last year. You had Steven Jones, Jackson Powers Johnson, and Marcus Harper are all returning this year that played real meaningful snaps. And then departing, you had Big Sala, you had Alex Forsyth, TJ Bass, and Ryan Walk. That's seven guys who played consistent, meaningful snaps. Weren't necessarily a starter, but they were on the field quite a bit and have set themselves up to be starters in the gut in the case of a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson. So that's a conversation that is best had between Elite Terry, our offensive line coach, and Brandon Baker, and how all those dynamics would work. But I just imagine that and, and look, it's a harsh world out there, but there's also the possibility. What if Baker's so good he comes in as a true freshman and Connerly's a stud, looks like an NFL draft pick? Baker could come in and just beat out Johnny Cornelius to be the starting right tackle. That 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 could happen. And you do everything as a coaching staff on a year-to-year basis. Like, yeah, you've made a level of commitment somewhat to these guys, but you can only do what is in the best interests of your team in that season. And if we go into 2024, and let's say McCroy, you know, needs a year to develop and, you know, get his body in the right shape and everything, which he probably does, but... Let's say that, you know, that's the case and you're looking at three good tackles, right? Let's say Cornelius has a good year, Connerly has a good year, but then Baker comes in and he's just, you can't, you can't afford to not have him on the field. Then maybe Cornelius gets bumped to being the sixth offensive lineman. Maybe Connerly gets bumped to being the sixth offensive lineman again. I don't know. I don't know how that would go, but I think one of those scenarios would play out in a way that would allow for the most talented guys to see the field. And it's hard to see how Baker wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to do that given the talent uh, that he has. And look, I, I, you know, as for who could, you know, be the starting left and right tackle that year, feels like I'm just sitting here trying to jinx us getting Brandon Baker. <laughs> if, if I say, yeah, I think he would start at right tackle and whatnot. So I'm going to go ahead and not say that and not make that prediction, prediction, but I think that's kind of how uh, the dynamics would work. Last question here from DePry, which is one letter away from DeVry, like the university, which I always think of the Key and Peel East West Bowl, West Bowl, Harvard University. DeVry University. Those East West Bowls are legendary, legendary skits. Anyway, DePry asks, Hey, Spencer, kind of an unorthodox question, but what are your top three Oregon games of the past and why? And what game do you think is going to be the best this season? And now that we are so close to the season starting, as always, keep up the stellar work and cheers. So first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I always appreciate the kind words. I love hearing that you appreciate and enjoy the show. That's why I do it, because I want you to enjoy it. I want you to have something to, you know, help the days go by, keep you in touch with Oregon and give you something to enjoy about the Ducks until the season actually starts. And then we get there and we all get to react to the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between all together and such. So what's going to be the best game this season? It's hard to not look at that Washington game. Washington or USC would be my answer there. I think Texas Tech and Oregon State can be great games and will be tough games, by the way. But Washington, given what happened last year and the fact that it's on the road and that hopefully both teams are undefeated going into that game, that could be game day, could have big implications. And then USC's last hurrah at Autzen Stadium, I I tell you what, I know Autzen fans and all of you who have been and go regularly, you know this, Autzen brings the juice every single game. I think they're going to have another level for USC in that particular game. Uh, So that's that one. But Top three games of the past. Let's go past all time. Uh, You know, not just in in my lifetime that I've seen necessarily. Number one would have to be the pick. Number one would have to be the pick because that is widely seen and understood as the play that changed Oregon football forever. It has been all uphill since the pick. So I think the pick has got to be number one. There are a lot of different ways you could go. I think the Fiesta Bowl in 2001 is just missing the cut for me here, but 
I'm going to go with 2009, the Halloween game against USC. I know that season didn't end the way we wanted it to. It was a Pac-10 championship. It was a Rose Bowl appearance. Beat the Bees in the Civil War that year in awesome fashion uh, with the Rose Bowl berth on the line. But that game against USC was the changing of the guard. That was USC had dominated. It was USC. It was USC. Okay, here comes Oregon. And then Oregon won the conference in 2009. They won it in 2010. They won it in 2011. And we've won it in 2014 and so on and so on and Rose Bowls and everything like that. So I'd say that's uh, that, that, that's got to be up there uh, as well, number two. And look, a lot of different ways uh, that I could go for the next one. Um, top three Oregon games of the past. I, I just... My 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 gut is torn here. My heart is torn because when we finally broke through and won the Rose Bowl in 2011, I remember being a kid watching that game and I was so excited. I was so happy. It was so great to just see that, oh my gosh, we finally did it. We're not going to have to deal with having lost again in a big game. We, we broke through. I think that was a great one. But I, I'd go 2015-14 regular season the first ever college football playoff semifinal and beaten Florida State 59 to 20. Appeared in the national championship game for the second time ever. You know, capitalized or punctuated rather a Heisman Trophy season for Marcus Mariota. I don't know that it gets much bigger than that, than giving yourself a chance to play for the one that we're still waiting for, for Oregon to win. So a lot of great options. Definitely. Drop your thoughts in the YouTube comments on on the best games for Oregon ever. But those would be my three. is The pick, the changing of the guard on Halloween night in 2009, and winning the first ever college football playoff game and a chance to play for the national championship. What are your favorite games? Let me know. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.